Thank you so much, Cody. You did a great job with that song, and that is the title of our message this morning, The God of Angel Armies. And so if you'd open up your Bible with me to 2 Kings chapter 6, I'll allow you to find your place there. 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to begin a series of messages about spiritual beings that I've entitled Angels and Demons. And this week we'll look at God's holy angels, and then next week we'll look at the uh, seraphim and cherubim, and the week after that we'll look at the devil and his demons. And so today we're looking at the holy angels of God, and this is a wonderful, wonderful story that we find in 2 Kings chapter 6, and I really, really love this story. I think it's one of my favorites in all of the scripture. There's been occasions that I believe the Lord has allowed me to encounter angels here on this earth, uh, and I've known other people who have encountered angels here on this earth, and I know of one lady... Um, that she told me a story about how whenever she was in the operating room, she saw someone there, a, a bright, shiny person there. And then after she got out of the, uh, the operating room, she talked to the surgeon about that, that other surgeon that was in the operating room, and the surgeon said, there was, I was the only surgeon in the operating room. And then a little while later, as she was recovering, she saw... Someone, the same person standing at the foot of her bed. And so she saw that angel there. I wonder if you've seen an angel before. You may have seen an angel and didn't even know it. And here's the biblical truth that I want us to see today. We are spiritually blind until the Lord opens our eyes to see. We are spiritually blind until the Lord opens our eyes to see. And sometimes he allows us to see things that we never knew even existed that we never knew could exist. But more importantly, the Lord wants us to see His love for us and His plan for our life. And we're spiritually blind to that and the activity of our God around us until the Lord opens our eyes. I think about what the Lord said to Nicodemus. He said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see that. Until the Lord opens up your eyes, you'll never be able to see the things of God. Now that was the case for the servant of Elisha here in 2 Kings chapter 6. And so if you found your place there with me, go ahead and stand up. We'll look at 2 Kings 6 beginning in verse 15. Let's read this wonderful story. Read down through verse 23. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master... What shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please, strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the city, in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, you shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we admit to you our own spiritual blindness at times. And Father, we know that unless you open our eyes, we could never see the things of God, we could never see your kingdom. And Father, we do know that today, you offer to us 
The opportunity not only to see the kingdom of God, but to enter the kingdom of God by the shed blood of Jesus. And so today, Lord, I pray for spiritual eyes to be open. I pray, Father, for hearts to be ready to receive your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would show us new and wonderful things from your word that we've never seen before. Lord, use my mouth today to speak your truth into the hearts and minds of these who listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, you may be seated. We are spiritually blind until the Lord opens our eyes. Well, I want us to talk specifically about the angels from this text. Now, the Bible doesn't call them the angels here. There's a couple of words that are used in the Bible to, that are translated angels. In the Old Testament Hebrew, the word melech, melech is angel. And uh, in Greek, it's angelos. And that's really where we get the word uh, angel from. And these are these Bible, even though that word doesn't occur here in the text, it's clear that these are armies of angels that are surrounding Elisha on the mountain. And so the, I want us to make a couple of observations. The first observation that I want us to see is the presence of angels. The presence of angels. And now we see that he, they're here in this text, but in the Bible, the Bible teaches us that angels are nearly everywhere. They're all over the place, all over the earth, up and down, upon the earth, and they're in heaven with God. One thing about angels, though, that we might, we might need to say is that angels are not omnipresent. They can't be everywhere all at one time like God can be. They're less than God. They're created by God, but they're just about everywhere. They're numerous in this text. If we look at the Scripture again, the servant of the man of God rose and he beheld an army with horses and chariots. It was all around the city. And so there were, Ben-Hadad is the king of Syria and he's gotten aggravated by Elisha because he goes out to, to do war with the Israelites and it doesn't matter where he goes or what he does, it's like the army of Israel already knows what he's going to do. Well, that's because there's a prophet in Israel named Elisha. And Elisha is telling the king of Israel where Ben-Hadad's army is going to be constantly. And so it makes Ben-Hadad upset. So he says, well, this, this guy Elisha, he's got to go. I'm going to get rid of him. So when he finds out where he is, Ben-Hadad sends, sends his whole army down after one man, after Elisha, to get him. And well, Elisha knew he was coming, obviously. Elisha was prepared, but he didn't gather up the armies of Israel to go out and fight against this great army of Ben-Hadad. He knew that there was an army of angels surrounding him. And so as we think about the presence of angels, we need to remember a few, a few verses of Scripture that talk to us about the presence of angels in our lives. Psalm 34 and verse 7, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. Amen. I love that. Whenever I go to bed at night, lay my head down on my pillow and know that the armies of the Lord are encamped around my house. I think about that. Hebrews 13 and verse 2. I love this one too because this, is, this makes you think a little bit, doesn't it? Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. We think about this in this context, the writer of Hebrews is actually referring to Abraham and how Abraham entertained three dinner guests and two of them went on down to the, to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and eventually upon that city was rained down hellfire and brimstone. But the one that stayed back, we, we, we understand, is a, a picture of the Lord Jesus and Abraham's entertaining him, feeding him. And he didn't know who he was. Took him a few minutes to realize, hey, I'm in the presence of the Lord. And then he starts to talk to the Lord about, hey, I know what you're here to do. And he starts to kind of negotiate. Well, not really negotiate, but just ask the Lord, are you really going to destroy the city? Even if there's ten people, the Lord would not destroy the city. What that meant was that Sodom and Gomorrah was as evil as it gets. Less than ten people in the whole city feared the Lord. Well, Abraham was entertaining angels unaware. And, you know, I think there's probably many occasions in our life that we're entertaining angels unaware. And someone somewhere is taking notes 
about those encounters. To see what we do. Moments where we can prove our faith. Genesis 32, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim means two camps. Because Jacob had his camp there, but what Jacob realized was that, was that the armies of the angels of God were encamping around him to protect him. What a truth. Angels are numerous upon the earth, but none of them are omnipresent. They can't be everywhere at all time. But we can, if we think about the words that are used in the Old Testament, myriads of angels. And you look in the New Testament, and Jesus talks about legions of angels. How many must there be? There must be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of angels that God has created. John Patton was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands. One night, hostile natives surrounded the mission station. And they were intent on burning the place to the ground. But when daylight came, after Patton and his wife had prayed all night long, when daylight came, all of the native warriors left and fled. Well, a while later, the chief of the natives came to know the Lord by the missionary efforts of John Patton. And one day, they just happened to be talking, and John remembered the night where the natives were surrounding the house, the camp, and they prayed all night long, and the enemies fled. And he asked the chief, he said, why didn't you attack the camp? Why did you decide to leave? And the chief said, who were all those men with you there? The chief said that he, they decided not to attack because of the hundreds of big men in shining garments, with drawn swords, circling all around that station. Amen. They prayed and God answered by sending angel armies. Wow. Angels are like Visa. They're everywhere you want to be. I think about one day whenever I was over in Israel, and it was at not that time that I should have been going up to the, to the Western Wall. It was a time for the Muslims to go in, but I didn't know that. I didn't know a whole lot about I didn't read up enough like I should have. Next time I go to Israel, I'm going to read a lot more before I go. But when I was there, it was the wrong day. I think it was Friday. I, was, I wasn't supposed to be going to the Western Wall. And uh, I said, well... Let's, let's go on up to the Western Wall, Dad. And so we turned and we started to go into the gate where you could go in. And before we could even get to the gate, there was this really tall NATO soldier. Big guy. I mean, his muscles were bigger than my legs. And he had this big submachine gun that he had beside him. And he, he said, oh, wait a minute. You cannot go in. And I said, we just want to go to the wall. Can't we go in? He said, are you Muslim? I said, no, I'm not Muslim. He said, you don't need to go in. I said, okay. But then I asked my dad. I said, did you see that guy? My dad said, what guy? To this day, my dad, I think he has a bad memory, but still, he should have remembered that. He never saw the dude. I was the only one that saw him. And I think that that day, that angel was encamped there to save my life. To keep me from going in. Maybe. But we never know. But one thing we do know is that the presence of angels in our world is very real. Very real. And what it points to is a God who watches over us. Who keeps His eye on us. God doesn't need angels. He sends angels for us. But I want you to see, secondly, the power of the angels. Now look again with, the, with me in the text. Pick it up in verse uh, 16. 
He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. If you think about that word more, what is, what is the Bible talking about here whenever Elisha says they're more? Well, first of all, they're more numerous. There's more of them than there are of the enemy. I praise God for that. I, I think about how the Bible talks about how one-third of the angels were swept away by the tail of the dragon. What does that still leave in heaven? Two-thirds. <laughs> that means that the armies of God are twice as large as the armies of the devil. Somebody say amen right there. The army of God is twice as big as the devil's. Jesus said, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They're more numerous and as well, they are more powerful. He says, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more powerful than those who are with them. And listen to what happens next in verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened his eye, opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots. Of what? Of fire. Of fire. All around Elisha. Fire. And the Bible is often associated with the divine presence of God. Got a couple of examples. Pillar of fire led the Israelites through the desert by night. Do you remember that? Also, 1 Kings, Elisha called down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. Do you remember that? And when Elisha was taken up, he was carried up in a whirlwind and in a chariot of fire. The divine presence of God. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 21, the angel touches the offering that, that uh, what's his name? You know, <laughs> Gideon has put out on a, on a rock. The angel takes his staff and he touches the offering and just with a poof of smoke and fire, poof, it's gone. Angels are super powerful. Not only are they more powerful, they're also more intelligent. More wise than we are. But let me tell you something else about angels. Not only are they not omnipresent, they're not omnipotent like God is. They don't know everything. They're not omniscient. They're not omnipotent. They can't do anything and everything that they want to do. They are bound to do the will of their Creator, Almighty God. They are soldiers in His army. Acts chapter 12 and verse 7 and the Bible talks about how Peter is in prison. Behold, the angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him. Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Just a touch of the angel and those shackles fell off. Peter, later on in 2 Peter, he comments and he says, Whereas angels... Though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Listen to those words that he says. They are greater in might and power. They're powerful. I think that's why, in, a, in nearly every occasion where an angel appears to someone in the Bible, the very next phrase is, do not fear. <laughs> Don't be afraid. And we think about angels in the Bible, they're often uh, represented as men. Never in the scripture is an angel represented as feminine, but that sometimes they're represented as men and shrouded in the likeness of men. But when we see them revealed, they're always bright and brilliant, extraordinary, amazing. They display the glory of God in creation. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome Him, for He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world. And what that reminds us is that God in His, in His omnipotence, He exerts His authority and His power through the created thing. But we are not to worship them. Colossians 2 and verse 18 says, Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism. 
a little tongue tied, and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. So we're told clearly in Scripture that we do not worship angels. And if that were not enough, John actually falls down and worships at the feet of the angel who is showing him the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers to hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then later on in 22 verse 9, but he said to me, you must not do that. Because John's fallen down again at the feet of the angel. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and the prophets. And with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So when we see the angels... And we think about angels. And anytime you see and you read about the angels in the Bible, it should remind you not to be enamored and all of those things about angels, but to worship the God who has the power to create angels. Worship God. Angels are amazing. But only the God who created them is worthy of your heart's devotion. And so the third observation that I want us to make. I want us to see the purpose of the angels. Because I think we often we kind of skip over this part of the story. Because we see that Elisha prays to the Lord and says, please strike this people with blindness. And he strikes the people with blindness. These, this great army that's come up again. The army of Ben-Hadad has come up against the king. And come up against Elisha the prophet. And so Elisha prays that they're struck with blindness and instantly these angels of chariots of fire, they cause blindness in the camp, the army of Ben-Hadad. And then Elisha leads them away from where they are into the city of Samaria. Well, who's there? Well, the king of Israel is there. He leads them to the king. And as soon as they get to Samaria, in verse 20, Elisha prays, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And in verse 21, as soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? I mean, you can imagine his enthusiasm, his excitement. They, this army of Syria that's been raiding and pillaging, now they're in, the, in my grip, in my grasp. All I need to do is strike them down. And what we find out is that's not why the angels came. Every good, red-blooded American man loves a good action story and a good victory. We look at the story and we think, oh, well, they should have won the victory. Slaughtered all of those heathens. But that's not what God did. First of all, they're messengers. We look at the purpose of the angels. They're messengers. They announce good news. They forewarn of God's judgment. And in fact, they will carry out the judgment of God on that last day. And they warn us about impending doom. They're messengers. They also tell us about great things that God is doing. In the New Testament, the angel Gabriel came and he spoke to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, and told him that he was going, his wife Elizabeth was going to have a child, announcing the good news. They're messengers. They're also mighty warriors. We've already talked about how awesome they are. But the Bible talks about them as guardians. Long before Marvel decided to put a flight jacket on a raccoon, God had already created the guardians of the galaxy. Also in Daniel chapter 10, the Bible talks about how they're guardians of nations and how these different nations, Michael and other uh, nations had angels over them that were watching over them. Nations and people. Also of children. Matthew 18 and verse 10. Jesus says, see that 
you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now we don't know for sure if there's a one-to-one correlation between the guardian angel of children and the number of children on this earth. We don't know that, because it could be that one angel is assigned to 20 children, even though I think that that would probably not go well with uh, the, the ratio requirements that we have over at the PLC. So I think that they, some of these angels probably have their hands full if that's the case, depending on whose kids are watching. But there's guardian angels for children. And in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we see that there's guardian angels of churches. And I pray to God when we come together in this place that God would put His angels at the door to keep the devil out. Don't you be guilty of bringing the devil in. They're mighty warriors. They're musicians. I think if we look at what we see in Scripture, their voices are amazing. And we look at the announcement to the shepherds in the New Testament, and you see this, this army of angels. The Bible says there's a host, uh, the heavenly host, the army. That's what that word host means. It's an army of angels, and what do they come to do? They come to announce to the shepherds, and then what do they do? They break out in joyous song. They're singing. And the Bible says there will be more rejoicing before my heavenly Father before the angels of my heavenly Father in heaven. The Bible teaches us that the angels sing and God dances and rejoices over one sinner who repents. They're musicians. Job 38 and verse 7. This is old, old, probably, if not the oldest book in the Bible. One of the oldest books in the Bible. It speaks about where were we? Where was Job? When the morning stars sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Why were they shouting for joy? Over the creation of God. Psalm 103, 20-22 Bless the Lord, O you His angels, you mighty ones who do His word, obeying the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all His hosts, His ministers who do His will. Bless the Lord, all His works in all the places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. They're musicians. They're singers. Lastly, they're ministers. See in the Scripture how they come to us whenever we have need. Mark chapter 13. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 1 verse 13. And he, Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And He was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to Him. We see also that the angel ministers to Elijah after he's fought the battle on Mount Carmel and he's running afraid. And the angel said, Arise and eat. He looked and behold, there was at his head caked, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And he got up, he did it again. And the Bible says he went on in that food for 40 days with that food. Angel food. That's the best food. You know, that's the best advertisement right there for angel food cake. You can go 40 days on angel food cake. (laughs) And we see that this is what happens here in the text as well. What happens is this army, they wake up. They've been blinded. And they've been wandering around groping. And finally they make it to Samaria. They're in the presence of the king. Elisha tells the king, you better not kill them. God just spared them. You should not kill them. And so what is done for this army? Read it with me again. Verse 22, he answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them. Feed them. Minister to them, in other words. That they may eat and drink and go to their master. This army came hostile, ready to kill the prophet Of God. And God in His infinite mercy said, let's feed them. And so God fed the army. And this hostile army went back home. Humble. 
to their master. I imagine the report of the commander. Well, we tried to find the prophet. And then all of a sudden, none of us could see. And then we woke up in the king's court eating bread that he gave us. The king of Israel, the people of God, they fed us. Wow, what a message. How many of you ever been to the Hoover Dam? It's on my few of you. It's on my bucket list. I want to go one day. Hoover Dam uh, from 1936 to 1957 actually held the record as the tallest dam. 726 feet tall. It holds back the Colorado River and a couple of tributaries. Well, while they were building it, the Bureau of Reclamation, the department that was subsidizing the project, supplied three, listen, listen to this whopping number, 3.2 million cubic yards of concrete for the dam itself, plus another 1.1 1. 1, 1. 1 million cubic yards for the power plant in addition to those facilities. Listen to this staggering fact. The quantity of concrete would be enough to build 3,000 miles of road, a full-size highway from one end of the United States to the other. The dam holds back the river which flows at about 8 million gallons per minute. 8 million gallons per minute. The water pressure at the base of the dam is an estimated 45,000 pounds per square foot. That's 3,750 PSI for any of you math people. Pounds per square inch. You've got about 50 pounds, maybe 35, 40, 50 pounds max in your tires. Your garden hose at home, about 50 PSI. 45,000 pounds per foot of pressure. Concrete has to be strong. In fact, they were so afraid of the concrete heating up so much and during its curing phase that they had to actually put ice water in the river. The world's largest cooler freezer ever made was made on, set on the base of the river and dumped ice into the river during the curing phase. Otherwise, it would have taken about 120 years for all that concrete to cure. They cured it quickly. It's some of the strongest concrete man's ever invented. It has to be strong. You know why? Because it's holding back the flood. It's holding it back. Jesus said, Do you not think that I can appeal to my Father and He will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? In that garden, Jesus was holding back the flood because at His discretion, 144,000 angels would have descended, obliterated the earth, rescued Jesus out of the hands of sinful men. But that's not how the story ended. The Bible teaches us that Jesus willingly held back those angels. The strongest force known to man is the love of of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's what held Him to the cross for your sake and my sake. But at the end of time, the Bible says that the angels will descend upon the earth. They will gather together the elect. And then they will toss the rest of us that don't know Him into the lake of fire. What's holding back the flood today? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. The very existence, Peter says, of you and me on this earth is a display of the mercy and grace of God. 
He's patient with us, with you and with me, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That all should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And He's holding back the angels right now. He's holding them back. Because their swords are drawn and they're ready. To enact the judgment of God upon this earth. Because of the sins of mankind. But God is patient with you. He's allowed you to be here today. To hear God's offer of salvation. To know that there is a God who created not only the angels in heaven. But He created you. And He loves you. And He's endowed you. With His almighty image and presence upon this earth. Knowing that, that if you will call out to Him, He will enter in to your heart and save you and set you free. But if you turn your back on Him, all that awaits is a fearful expectation of judgment. So what's your decision today? Will you turn to the God who made you? The God who loved you enough that He sent His one and only Son to die on the cross for you. The God who was raised again on the third day and lives forevermore and saves all who call upon Him. Will you turn to Him today? If you would do that, it's a simple prayer. Just say this prayer with me. Dear Lord God, I know that you created me. And you have a purpose for my life. But Lord, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I've done things that I know are wrong and I haven't done the things that I know are right. And I deserve the penalty for my sin. But Lord, I believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. He took my place. And I believe that He was raised again on the third day. And that He's alive. So I put my faith and my trust in Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Save me a sinner today. Give me a future and a hope. I'll spend the rest of my life living for you, and loving you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you stand with me? We're about to have our invitation. And this invitation is for you. If you've prayed that prayer, and you meant it with all your heart, and you're trusting Jesus for the very first time today to save you from your sin, we want to know so we can rejoice with you and so that we can celebrate as a church and we can love you and lead you and the way the Lord would have you go. If you're looking for a church home, a family of faith, and you know that Myrtle Grove Baptist Church is where the Lord wants you, and we welcome you to join our church during this invitation. And if you need prayer, you just want someone to love you and pray for you, you come. We're going to have prayer counselors at the front, and I'll be here. We'll pray with you. You can come to the altar, or you can pray right where you are. Use this invitation as the Lord would have you. Let's sing together. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back Though none go with me Still I will follow 
Though not go with me, still I will follow. Though not go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. back. Paul tells us in Ephesians that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, the rulers, the principalities, the authorities that rule in darkness. And so as you go out this week, you're going to bump up against the forces of Satan. If you know the Lord Jesus, it's the reality of the Christian life. And we fight against evil. But don't ever forget that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and love Him and protects them. He's with you. Your angels are around you. Might, uh, might make you think a little bit about what you do. To think about an angel watching you. But more, than, more importantly than that, Lord Jesus sees everything that we do. He's watching us. He's watching over us. And He loves us. So love Him and serve Him this week with all you got. Give Him everything you got. Amen. Alright, you be seated for a moment. Good morning, Myrtle Grove. Uh, Following next week's service, uh, we will actually be having an information and discussion meeting about getting upward sports kickback uh, up. As uh, many of you may know, in the past, we've done different sports. Um, We've done upward soccer, upward basketball, upward cheer. Um, But given everything, we uh, were not able to do it in the previous years. Uh, And we just want to start the process of getting that started back up as a way uh, to reach the community, uh, to give children an opportunity to really get started in sports in a great uh, setting. Um, For a lot of students, this for a lot of children, this might be their their first time in team sports. And it's great to start on a good note um, for that to, to help them develop a love for the sport. And then also as an opportunity to share the gospel with them throughout all of that. Uh, And so just following the service over in the fellowship hall, um, next week's service immediately following after, as soon as everybody kind of gets there, uh, they will be starting that meeting. Um, Next though, I I do have the privilege of uh, bringing up, uh, uh, sorry, he was Pastor Ron, uh, but Ron Lentini, um, to just talk to you really quickly, if you want to come up here, Ron, about uh, upcoming events through um, the Unity Movement, uh, and then uh, he'll have us close us in prayer. It is a uh, blessing, truly, for Merrill and I to be here this morning, to be in worship with you all. Thank you, Pastor Josh, uh, for a very anointed, powerful message from God. It definitely touched my heart and and I know the hearts of all the folks that are here today. And Cody, um, thank you for, um, and the praise and worship team for leading us in worship this morning. We are so incredibly thankful for what the Lord has done in bringing uh, this ministry team, this pastor, worship leader, the, of course the entire staff, Stephen, so proud of him, uh, Chris, Larson, all of them. And uh, for all of you for your faithfulness. We know that uh, God is gonna bring good things to the Myrtle Myrtle Grove Baptist Church family, to all of you uh, here in the months and years ahead. I have no doubt about that. Um, God's going to bless this work and this ministry. You know, it was five years ago, right here in the sanctuary, that the Lord birthed a a vision for unity in the body of Christ. And next week, Sunday evening, uh, we're gonna have a unity worship celebration in this venue right here. And I'm so thankful for um, the kindness of you all allowing uh, you know, that event to uh, take place here because it's just so fitting. Uh, pastors and worshipers from uh, uh, numerous uh, different denominations, races, cultures, 
even some with different political views, will gather here together in this place around the gospel of Christ to bring glory to the Father's name. So I want to encourage you to come be a part of that event right here at your church. Uh, it'll begin at 6.30 p.m. Uh, you will be blessed. It's going to be a great opportunity looking back uh, of where the Lord has taken us. We have now some 30 different churches representing nine different denominations and non-denominational groups. We'll be introducing three new pastors and churches that will be have recently uh, requested to become part of the unity movement. It's going to be a wonderful time. And again, thank you, uh, Pastor Joss, for your leadership. May God bless you, Allison, your family, Cody, all of y'all. Uh, what a blessed day this is today. Give God praise and glory. Amen. Do you join me in prayer as we close? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together in fellowship, to be able to lift up your name in worship and praise. Lord, thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, to be able to reach out in the community and spread the gospel. Uh, Lord, uh, as we're getting closer to the school year, be with the teachers as they're preparing. Be with the students as they get ready to go back. Uh, be with those uh, camps that are just finishing up that have been uh, presenting the gospel to students, to children, all throughout the summer. Um, be with their staffs as they're returning home as some of those camps are ending. For those that are just finishing, let them finish strong uh, and pointing everything back to you. Uh, Lord, be with uh, just the union movement. Just, just strike up the importance of uh, being unified in worshiping you, Lord. Let us be able in all things to focus on what's truly important, and that's the gospel that you've given us, Lord. Uh, let us be able uh, to grow uh, together as a family, to not, not worrying about the differences that we may have, but focusing on the, the differences that you've made uh, in that that you impact us in a way that they, um, that the differences won't matter, the, the, whether we agree on everything won't matter, but that you are above and in control of all things and that we can worship you freely and have a relationship with you. Um, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I feel like I had something else to say.